Forums like this that the National Trust are putting on are really good for getting communities to understand the importance of heritage. To understand how landscape, place, buildings and structures contribute to who we are, to what we're about. There's no better time than pre an election to raise most important issues and when we're faced with major issues like a climate crisis, heritage buildings being continually replaced with new when they could have actually been retained, it's really important that we develop um, this conversation publicly and for the election forum. Good evening everybody, my name is Catherine Pitkin and it's an absolute pleasure for me as the newly elected President of the National Trust of Australia and New South Wales to welcome you to the National Trust's 2023 Election Forum. But I would like to start by acknowledging that we are here today on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land. And the National Trust acknowledges the elders past, present and emerging of the Gadigal people and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island of people here, who are here tonight. As the recent proposals for Central Station have shown, it's of course one thing to keep something, but it's quite another to keep it in a meaningful way. The Trust has developed eight election priorities this year which we feel can play a role in addressing this decline in heritage that we continue to witness. And these can roughly be divided into three main ideas. The first is to protect heritage. The second is to fund heritage. And the third is to incentivise heritage. So most of you will probably know there's no single source of environmental law in Australia. There's about 70 uh, environmental laws at the Commonwealth level, and there's many more at the state, at state and territory levels across Australia. And they're all administered by hundreds of bodies that are from the federal to state and the local level. A lot of those early laws, and some of them uh, you may be familiar with, were really quite successful in dealing with uh, point source pollution. So things like polluting in rivers and uh, pollution of the air. And they're also really good at kind of other, what we might think of now, looking backwards, uh, low-hanging fruit sort of issues. So creating large world heritage conservation areas, which we have the pleasure of enjoying now, and other forms of uh, national parks around the country. The sorts of environmental problems that we're facing today, however, don't have a lot of those easy wins still built into them. The sorts of things that climate change has brought us are very complex, they're very cumulative, and they're often intractable. And current laws are not well suited to dealing with the types of challenges that they're throwing up. Climate change is going to lead us down a path of very significant developments in the coming years, particularly around renewable energy. So the best estimates are that we're going to need around a thousand times the land that we currently use for energy if we're going to meet our energy needs through renewables. And New South Wales has a lot of renewable energies in the pipeline. That's not to say they're bad. We need them and we need to be able to combat climate change. But they're going to be big and they're going to need to be pushed through at some sort of rapid pace. It's similarly for transmission lines and similarly for climate sequestration, uh, carbon sequestration as well. These types of things are likely to challenge heritage. Now, we could say... Um, We've got these provisions in there to allow big developments to go through. We're going to be, um, we're just going to kind of suck it and see, basically. Or we could say we're, we need to value heritage over um, allowing those uh, climate mitigation developments to proceed. We might also say we need to slow down and we need to actually build in other forms of assessment for these big developments. Um, developers don't like being slowed down, but it, it is a kind of choice and that can be built into the legislative architecture. What I would argue for, and I think it matches or it aligns with what David's suggesting around an attitude change, is we need more uh, strategic processes that engage a lot of people in the decision making. And that can bring in an attitude change into government. In the middle of this year, you will likely see um, some significant reforms come out around the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. And some of those reforms are likely to look at regional planning across all of Australia under um, something they're going to release around national standards for planning. That's going to identify areas that they want to protect, areas where they want development to happen, and areas where we need to exercise a bit of caution and a bit of extra assessment. 
It's possible, um, although it's a little unclear, but it's possible those plans will be able to bring an attitude change to New South Wales and maybe to other states as well. But part of that will be how that process is designed and kind of how many people participate and influence the shape of that regional planning. So I'd encourage you to keep your eye out for that because that may be a place where we can build in better protection um, for natural heritage and other areas. So in short, um, I think we need to be more strategic. I think if we're going to get some attitude change, we need more people participating in the planning process. And more generally, um, we need to think about how we're going to decide what we're willing to sacrifice, what we're not going to sacrifice, and how we're going to bring those two together as we move into an age of very significant climate change. So I've been asked to uh, really talk about um, the cultural heritage reforms that are happening. Most people have heard about those. And they're happening at both the state and the federal level right now. I think the, the biggest thing that we need to understand is this. Cumulative destruction of Aboriginal cultural heritage sites. So this is a bit of a heat map. This is a, from, from government records. And obviously the red is the destruction of Aboriginal cultural heritage. So I've just taken a snapshot looking at Sydney, Wollongong and out west and you can see the impact. You can see where the impact sits around major metropolitan or development areas. And it's really important to understand that because the landscape is our heritage. If we're destroying this and removing that, you're actually removing that connection to that country. So the cumulative impact is the big thing. It's not actually the single objects. And so much of what we do in heritage, particularly when we look at Aboriginal cultural heritage, is archaeological. We're looking at the individual sites and objects. But the reality is, by doing that, you're forgetting the big picture. You're forgetting that connection to country. There was a paper that I actually wrote around um, the Dendrobium mine expansion down in the Illawarra. I also wrote a similar one about Warragamba Dam and the wall raising. How do we look at Aboriginal cultural heritage in those forms? What are the protections? What are the guidelines? What are the things that say, this is the way you need to look at, the, at this situation? So up there, I've identified those, some of those guiding documents for us in this state. You know, it includes talking to Aboriginal people about their cultural and heritage. It includes discussing what it means. But at the end of the day, I see report after report that says the Aboriginal community acknowledges this is of high significance to them. However, from a scientific perspective, it's of low significance. So overall, we'll rate it as low significance and we can develop on that. Where do you sit? You sit with the previous slide where you just see the destruction of Aboriginal cultural heritage. A complete removal of that. And the reality that, of that for me as an Aboriginal person is you're saying my heritage is not worthy. It's not worth recognising. Well, let's just record it and put it in a little box and then we'll pack it up over here. But that isn't my connection to that space or place. And it's also not the obligation we all have as custodians of this land. Because that landscape is what tells us what we should be doing. We also need to understand the cumulative destruction issue. And this is a, something I've point, I point out in most reports that I write in this space, where we've got thousands of sites, but we might have, for argument's sake, in this room, just say, I've oh, got three sites, one up the back there, one in the middle, one over here. We're looking at them as three individual pieces, or three individual objects. The reality is, you destroy that one in the middle, you've probably destroyed all three sites because they're interrelated to this. But we don't do that. It's taken by individual objects, individual places. And you actually destroyed all three things and you destroyed that landscape value. So what ends up happening? This. So in the middle there, that's mine subsidence. That 
shelter structure there has over 400 individual artworks. On the left here, confession, that's my place. <laughs> but it's erosion because development's occurring up the road that's channeling greater velocity of water down that creek system. In that area, for me personally, I can tell you there's freshwater mussels, I can get bass fishing there. There's a whole gathering structure that I can have in that place. Over the other side there, we see illegal mountain bike trails being built on culturally sensitive areas. It's a national park. It's actually illegal to do that. But it's happening and nobody's really doing anything about it. The worst thing with the subsidence in the middle there, for me, is, okay, we're destroying that. That, that cave, the structure, everything that goes with that. But it's, it's put down to economics. We're creating jobs. But you're saying that, again, my value and my cultural value is worth nothing. Because you're prepared to see that for a few dollars. The point that I really wanted to make is the construction industry is contributing 40% of carbon emissions to the planet at the moment. And one of the critical things that we need to do as an industry is change the way we do things. And um, that's important to keep in our minds because it is part of how we position and strengthen um, the heritage conversation. When we think about tackling the climate crisis and we think about it in relation to the built environment, we really have to understand how important existing buildings are to solving that problem. There's also a growing call to adapt existing buildings and to understand what's happening. So um, there was a commission set up which was called the Commission for the Future of Sydney CBD. I was one of the commissioners on it and it was a, essentially um, a process that was derived with high levels of consultation to actually look at how do we um, reimagine our CBDs post-COVID? And also that is another challenge that will help us. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. But one of the big things about that, and you can see it's just been released in Revaluing Sydney CBD Report, which New South Wales Business put out, is about how we adapt existing buildings, how we think about rezoning, and how we actually try and um, can reinvent and um, uh, bring back to life the existing buildings we have rather than seeing them as a burden. Radical adaptation is something we've been working on for a long time. This is um, the MLC building in North Sydney, which many of you may know is currently in the Land and Environment Court. Um, it was a building that we, we worked on, um, I guess, the revitalisation of this building uh, in 2001 for MLC and it was really transforming the existing building through its internal workings into a really active contemporary workplace. And I guess the point being is this building has an incredibly flexible floor plate um, and it demonstrates how some of these buildings, and they're not necessarily, um, they might be in the modern era, but they are able to adapt, they are able to continually get reinvented. Um, we also worked on the Marrickville Library, which was reinvigorating, you know, transforming what was the old Marrickville Hospital uh, into a new community hub and trying to bring together um, that, that heritage and social fabric of the place with, um, with a new community facility. And it's, you know, it's incredibly busy and buzzy now. We're currently working on Sirius, probably one of the most high profile ones around. And this building is obviously incredibly uh, interesting. It was done in the, designed in the 1970s by Teo Goffers and um, part of the mandate, I guess, that we gave about being involved was we had to retain the building. There were other solutions that were knocking it down. So the reason that I wanted to bring these up, and I know some of them will be contentious for you and some of them will be, um, you know, you might, you might agree with, but is that there is a moment that we're in at the moment where we actually have an intersection happening of a range of different issues. And we can, if we can harness that intersection point and come at this with more of a whole systems approach, 
it will enable us to achieve more. Um, and that's, you know, I guess what I would like to propose as part of my contribution to the panel. And when we do get it right, and when we do get that mixing of old and new and country and cultural history and natural history, you know, it just, it just works and people take to it. I think one of the things that Ninochka showed is, is about the conflict that sometimes exists between um, new and old. I think Central Station is a very good example of that. The main concern that I think the Trust has had is that the new buildings within the State Heritage Precinct. Mm. Um, and I think that that's where the, the real nexus lies. But at an architectural level, I think it's fair to say that the retention of the small shed at the bottom is actually impacting the new building, which itself is a, you know, a structure to be talked about. Uh, how do we deal with that intersection, I suppose? Are we actually doing a disservice to the new building and the old building in that instance? Um, I'm trying to think about how controversial I want to be at the moment. <laughs> Uh, I think there's a couple of conflicts going on in Tech Central, to be honest. I, I do feel the densification is too high, and if we reduce the densification within that precinct, it would actually enable the various elements to coexist rather than to thinking um, they need to be built on top of, you know, some of the existing elements. Um, so that decision, those decisions are made outside of our realm, of course. Um, but we do end up living with those decisions as we try and work with the projects. I think we're all very familiar in this room, particularly of thinking that if we write a heritage impact statement or a CMP, then the job's done, we put that on the shelf. Mm. And I was really interested in what you were saying, Paul, about just recording it and thinking we've dealt with it. Yeah, it's, it's a, well, that's the way Aboriginal cultural heritage is treated. It's, if we can um, record it, we can put it in a box because it's usually small objects. Let's put it in a box and let's go bury it under that tree over there so it's out of the way of the development. Which, which I'll be honest, from my perspective, I find really intriguing. One, because the objects that quite often are so valued aren't for me personally the most valuable. Mm. The most valuable is actually the landscape. Mm. It's actually that, that country that we're on and the values that country talks to and speaks of. The objects are the things that are left behind. Um, but because Aboriginal cultural heritage is driven through archeological lenses, they're the things that are seen as important. One of the things you touched on was about incentivizing heritage. And I think that that's one of the, the, tree, the tricks there. It's not easy to retain an old building sometimes and work in with it uh, as an architect. I know that. I think one of the uh, comments that came through um, from the government architect recently was that Abby Galvin, who um, was, was on a train, um, she said that our most impactful carbon positive actions lie in retrofitting existing buildings. And I think you were getting there. Even if it costs more, Paul was alluding to this, is it worth it? That's the trick. Mm, mm, How yeah, can I we think... incentivise that? Absolutely. I, th I think it's critical. Like, if we don't incentivise it, we just won't get the traction because, um, you know, as I said, we are in a position where 98% of our buildings in cities are typically existing. And the point you made at one of your election promises about incentivising, I think, is absolutely critical. It, it is harder to retain buildings quite often. Um, and it is very quick to demolish a building. Like, it's like the quickest part of the whole process. Um, and that's a real challenge. Whereas, like, editing an existing building and improving its performance and, you know, bringing it back to life, it's, a, it's like a surgical edit process. It takes a, a level of care and time, um, and that means it costs more. And so I think if we can get a model where we can incentivise um, developers and government to retain existing buildings and look at that editorial process, um, it would be it would make a huge difference, I think, to the retention of buildings. And um, as in that 
uh, Business New South Wales report, we could also look at rezoning buildings or parts of the city to actually help bring new uses, which then bring the buildings to life as well. There's a lot of issues around biodiversity offsets at the moment. And I guess this is a, a question for you, Cameron. H how can we make sure that when we do set up these mechanisms, that we are, I would hope, in principle, trying to do the right thing, we're not actually setting ourselves up for failure. And I'm reminded of the recent example for the Western Sydney Airport, where in fact the land that was offset was land that was already protected. You know, if we're going to offset something, we need to add to it, not take what's already there. So, yep, that's a massive challenge. Um, <laughs> and you've got five minutes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's two levels. So at the New South Wales level. Um, I think a significant part of it is offsets have to be the last resort rather than kind of the go-to mechanism, which is what they've been. That's yep. one element. The second is it has to be properly enforced, which tends not to be the case. So you could look at um, a related thing is the um, Australia's water market. So over time, they've improved enforcement around that. It was bad. It is better than it used to be. Having someone actually checking that the offsets are going to survive. So with the Cumberland Plain plan recently, there's a lot of concern about um, the destruction of vegetation and the plan where it's going to actually be offset. Um, they it's, think the vegetation yeah, yeah, is not going to survive. South Wales exactly, right. It's not the same vegetation. Um, so yeah, enforcement and last resort, and also encouraging um, rather than offsets, or in addition to offsets, having ensuring farms and other landholders are pursuing um, credits, biodiversity credits, and, and pushing up the level of biodiversity first before you turn to offsets as well. And the federal government's plan, again, sort of to mention them, we're going to, you're going to see a national biodiversity market. That's, that's their plan um, under a nature positive plan. That's the idea. And that's going to involve a lot of these similar kinds of issues and similar kind of discussions about who's going to enforce it, how are we going to make the decisions about where things are going to go and where things aren't. And the bigger risk is all the money for the offset doesn't go to vegetation, it goes into a fund and then someone controls that fund. And what they do with that money is a very open question. I guess it's another case of instead of writing a report and putting it on a shelf, we're just collecting this money for offsets and putting it on. That's right. Mm. And of course, a small tree is very different to a big tree. Exactly. But it's still a tree in an accountant speak. Yeah. As a charity with no recurrent government funding, our funding and commitment to put on events such as this is a testament to our commitment to the trust core mission of advocacy and our role as a leading voice in heritage. And I'd like to remind you that you all have a voice and your community has a voice and it is really up to all of us to make heritage matter. Thank you for supporting us this evening. Mm -hmm.